fascinated by water, by what water does to us, with us, and what we do with water. And in the course of my research, also as a member of the Second Delta Commission, I have discovered that nowhere is that interaction between humankind and water more apparent than in our cities. Over half the world's population now lives in cities, and these are the places where the problems have concentrated themselves, what the tremendous problems that we have created for our built and natural environment. But at the same time, these cities are also the place where innovation is taking place, where we are searching urgently for ways to solve these very same problems. And I want to give you a few examples today. I think my interest in water probably goes back to my own personal roots, where I come from. I was born in a place which is very big, very empty, very flat, and very dry, the Mojave Desert in California. I was actually born on the Air Force Base, where um, the sound barrier was breached, where the first baby steps in space travel were taken, and later where the space shuttle landed when we finally had made that step to outer space. My father was a, a space engineer. I now live in a very flat, very small, very full, and very wet place, the Netherlands. And I have discovered that the relationship to water has really, really made this place. This is something that all Dutch people learn at school, but for me it was a revelation to discover how intensely, who, how intense that relationship is between water and this place where we live. This country would not survive without engineers who are succeeding in keeping the water out. Over 70% of the country's gross national product is earned below sea level, and a large part of the country's population lives in the west of the country, which is low-lying and therefore the most vulnerable to sea change. Management of water, therefore, is absolutely crucial to the survival of this country. And that means that the Dutch live in a landscape which is highly engineered, highly maintained, artificial, and that for everything you see here, there is a reason. And that reason is water. We see now how the climate is influencing our surroundings in an alarmingly fast speed. We see it, for example, within the boundaries of my own mother country, the United States, on the west coast where I come from, California. Uh, if you look at this picture and let that sign penetrate to what it actually means, lifeguards are usually posted where there's water. Uh, that is no longer the case. California is suffering the worst drought in human history and at a price of terrible suffering to farmers, to animals, and probably also to people because there is discussion of towns that will have to be abandoned because they simply cannot survive without water. At the same time, on the other coast, on the east coast, we all remember Hurricane Sandy and the amazing amount of damage and suffering that it caused, uh, even actually paralyzing the stock market for a number of days. Who in the United States would ever thought that the stock market could be so impacted by something so self-evident as water. I want to give you an example, uh, uh, show you a few examples of the strategies that we're uh, developing both in the Netherlands and in uh, other countries across the world for cities to deal with water in a way that will make the, protect the coastlines, that will... Um, uh, and actually make the cities more livable, healthier, and more attractive place to live. Cities are trying to use the water to make a problem into a, into a benefit, benefit, and to use that water to increase the quality of life in cities. And since so many of us now do live in cities, this is an urgent task for a large part of the world's population. This is a project in Rotterdam called the Water Square. The idea here is that as it's raining more and more often uh, in larger and larger quantities, the rain comes crashing down, the sewers can't deal with it, and it comes flushing back up. New York has this problem also. Um, and that is not necessarily very clean water to have washing through the streets. The idea of these water squares is that you create basins 
where the water is captured and held until it can gradually sink back into the sewer or into the groundwater. And that by creating these basins, you actually cool the urban heat islands and create attractive places to live. And I think this is a very interesting project because you see here how in searching for solutions to climate change, uh, urban designers, engineers, hydrologists are all coming together looking for mutual solutions. This is another project for the city of Rotterdam around the new institute. And the idea is to make that heavily paved area, urban area, into a, uh, a basin that also catches water, gives people a place for recreation where people can sit and talk and add some quality of life to an area which can also be used as water storage. And I think it's interesting that under pressure of the dilemmas we're facing, we're now finding solutions like this where you bring together all sorts of functions, both attractive ones and simple practical solutions, the climate square in Rotterdam. Another of the strategies that cities are looking for all over the world, and this one in particular in Hamburg, is the water square along the river, the Elbe in Hamburg. The Elbe is one of the rivers in Europe which still has a tremendous tide, seven to eight meters. And so when there's a storm, spring tide, storm, the water is pushed into the city and this square is flexible. It can flood, and all you have to do when the water goes away is bring in the cleaning crew, clean up some mud and some twigs, and your attractive urban space is still there in a resilient and attractive fashion. I think this is really the, every, what all cities in the world are searching for are ways to redesign the city in a way that they can accommodate water without suffering any damage and improve the quality of the urban environment. This is the, uh, a lot of cities are also now looking to restore water that they've lost. This is the, uh, used to be a huge freeway right through the center of Seoul in Korea. And they have removed the freeway, taken it off, and what did they have underneath? Seoul's original river, the Cheongchong River. And they have uh, redecorated it, reinstalled it almost in a Disney-like way but it is now a huge public draw, and you can see that the, the, the deep attraction that human beings feel for water is really expressed in the design and in the popularity of this place. Another place that's looking to restore water is Amsterdam. There's a plan to restore some of the historic canals in the city center. On the left, you see what this street looks like now. It's the Elandsgracht, for those of you who know Amsterdam. Cars, sidewalks, pavement, very busy, very compact, very um, urban in perhaps an old-fashioned way, if I could call it that. And on the right, you see a design to bring back the water into the canal, still accommodating the pedestrians and the cars and the bicycles. I think this is a master of compact Dutch urban design. And you see that cities everywhere are looking to restore their historic waterways, such as here. Another strategy, integrate your water safety into the existing city. This is in the town of Kampen, not far from here. And I think this is just a brilliant idea uh, where they have integrated water safety into the original medieval wall uh, of the city of Kampen along the river. And it's not easy to see, that's part of the secret. You see over here, and on this side of the wall, there are actually brackets bolted to the old brick walls. And when the water is high, the volunteers come in. They have what they call a high water brigade. They put on their jackets and their boots, and they're off to the crusade. They um, slot in a number of aluminum planks into all the openings along the medieval wall of the city, and the city is safe. This is part of that same uh, here. The planks are also slotted in, but this is also part of a wall that goes right in between the houses and down deep into the basement as part of the water protection strategy. It's almost invisible, which means that it's hard to get a heroic feeling about it. The old Dutch high-tech dominion approach to water was much more visible, much more heroic, but I think this is more of our time where we're integrating water safety into our existing environment in an attractive fashion. We're also using that water in all sorts of new ways. 
We have floating housing. This is one of the, uh, this is the largest project in the country of floating houses in the uh, new development of Eiburg, just outside of Amsterdam. And you see that we have also new, even more imaginative ideas about floating functions on water. For example, this idea for an enormous swimming pool in the East River in New York. There are also many other plans for swimming pools in rivers. One of the most successful is a plan by the architect Bjarke Ingels for Copenhagen. Copenhagen has cleaned up its harbor to the extent that you can actually swim in that water now. And they have a wonderful floating construction. It's really just a deck. And you can jump in the pool, you can lie in the sun, there's places to chat and to meet. And the way that w the actual surface of the water is becoming a new social space, I think is a really interesting development now. Of course, all this thinking about how to use our water is giving rise to all sorts of um, inventive ideas. This is an idea for a floating city by a young Rotterdam firm called Delta Sink. And he has uh, colleagues in Silicon Valley, some of those multi-billionaires in Silicon Valley who maybe don't really know what to do with all that money, <laughs> are thinking up new ways of living, for example, uh, building new cities on the water. Uh, just last Sunday, there was a, a program on Dutch TV where we saw the Silicon Valley billionaire Peter, Peter Thiel, who would like to live here and this would be his swimming pool. I wonder, if this, is this really a solution that will help mankind further? But it does tell us something about the new way of thinking about water and the extent to which water is becoming much more part of our built environment. Artists have also discovered the attraction of water and the interest that we now have in a new relationship to water as we see the climate around us changing. This is a lovely project by a Dutch artist named Juke Parlevlietz from the south of the country, from Zeeland. And she went out into the tidal flats of the Oosterschelde and planted a picnic table. And it has a marker so that when the tide comes in, the table completely disappears. And when the tide goes out, you can wade out to the table in your waders and take your lunch with you and have lunch on her picnic table. I think this is a lovely expression also of the way we are coming to accept that dealing with water is a much more, that we have to find a more flexible way of dealing with water, that sometimes some places are wet, sometimes they're dry, and that we can adapt to these changeable conditions. This is something new for us. And finally, I want to show you a project on the tidal uh, sea of the Vodder between the north of the Netherlands, the, the northern province of the Netherlands and the islands up to the north in this uh, tidal sea called the Vodder. This is the island of Terschelling. This is a design by a landscape architect, Bruno Dudens. And he is looking for a way to hold the sediment that comes in and out with the tide so that uh, a natural buffer will be created to protect this island against the rising sea level. And he drew up a beautiful project in which he brought in Dutch art, heritage, engineering, and I wanted to show it to you. It's called Vatland. This is actually me in a panorama photo taken with my iPhone. And this is what the project looks like from the air. Uh, you see that he set up all these uh, twig, willow twig patterns in the pattern of a Mondrian painting so that they will hold the slib and that from the air what you will actually see is Dutch heritage and engineering combined in a, I think, a truly magical way. I wanted to show you these examples that I hope will prove to you that invention is indeed the daughter of necessity. We are being forced into finding a new relationship to water, but that urgency is also releasing a tremendous wave of creativity. Uh, not only in the Netherlands, but here in the world. The Netherlands is leading since survival is so essential to the... Uh, and man water management is so essential to our survival. And I think... I don't know if we'll be in time with all these solutions, but I find it very heartening that there are so many wonderful ideas coming out of this urgent issue that's facing us all today. Thank you very much.